very good evening and a warm welcome to the program. We're coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nairo Room. And tonight we'll be talking about universal access to sexual reproductive health services. Well, universal means for all, right? For all. Okay. Um, very quickly, my guests in the studio with me, um, right next to me is Nancy Apio, who is the Gender Coordinator, Reproductive Health. Yes? Yes. Top Uganda. Okay. And uh, in the middle is Anna Kukundakwe, who is the Program Associate Center for Health, um, Human Rights and Development. That's Sehat. Yeah. yeah. And at the very end, we have uh, Masi Mbabazi Twine, who is a youth volunteer with Reproductive Health Uganda. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's say it as it is. Once again, welcome. We're talking today about access, universal access to sexual reproductive health services. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the conversations that's been going around is whether or not children or students in school should um, even get this information mm -hmm. on reproductive health. What mm -hmm. do you think? Um, in my opinion, I think uh, young people um, in school or out of school have uh, a right to have access to information and this information has to be, has to be on, on their sexual reproductive health. They need to know their body autonomy, they need to know the rights they have over those, the body parts that they hold. They, need, they, have the, they have the right to know that if they have sex, they will get pregnant. Well, that's in biology class though, isn't it? It's not sufficient. Some of these things, they will not talk, they will not talk about them because we've had this conversation, we've started biology all our lives and you get surprised that out there, the young people who still believe that when you have sex in a swimming pool, you actually don't get pregnant. Okay. That is clearly an indication of an information gap. Wow. What do you think, Masi? Well, I think that however much we say that we, there's a restriction for young people to get information on SRHR, they will still get the information. We have technology, they have phones, and they can easily access this information. So. Even if we don't talk about it, they'll have access to it. So better they get it from yeah. So better the they, they get it from us and the media. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're the experts. And I was looking at some statistics, and it says in 2008, an estimated 1.2 million unwanted pregnancies occurred in Uganda, mm -hmm. representing more than half of the country's 2.2 million pregnancies. Why do you think there's a rising number in unwanted pregnancies? Um, I think it starts from the conversation we started by having. Um, there is a huge information gap, and uh, this is where young people actually do not even have an idea. Or well, they have an idea that when they have sex, they will actually get pregnant, but they don't know how to prevent the pregnancy. For example, if I know that if I have, se if a young person knows that they, if they have sex, they will get pregnant, and maybe they can have a, an access to contraceptive, and most of these pregnancies have nothing to do with choice. Uh, most of them are as a result of um, rape and. Uh, and maybe things beyond their control. So it's still an information gap to know that if I am raped, I actually ha can have access to either an emergency contraceptive and maybe other services like PrEP. Okay, I yeah. think also uh, there are still cultures, we still have cultures whereby we still uh, think that it's okay for a young girl to get married. Yeah. There is teenage pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Even there is unmet need for modern contraceptives even among the older women. And mm -hmm. so you see that people ca are not yet having access to modern family planning services. And there is also statistics that I think in Uganda we have four out of 10 kids are not planned. And so <laughs> we, we give birth to kids not uh, because we are planned them. And so uh, one of the causes of the high uh, pregnancies of said could be the cultures that we have, marrying off young girls, sexual violence, sexual harassment, teenage pregnancies, and unmet contraceptive needs. Yes. Right, so you're all um, advocates really of family planning, right? Yeah. But th there's also a group of people who don't believe in family planning, who mm -hmm. don't actually want their children consuming this kind of information or even knowing about it. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say that however much we don't want young people to do contraceptives, to do family planning, but there are other avenues where they will get access to this medicine. You have pharmacies they'll get access to contraceptives. If you ask the young people about what they can do if they get pregnant, they'll actually give you the medicine you can use. They'll give you the names. 
you know, it goes about still uh, about the issue of whether young people need contraceptives or not. And at least going by the, uh, the statistics, uh, Uganda, um, the UDHS indicate that 15.2% uh, and 16.5% for boys and girls respectively uh, have, are sexually active. So uh, what that means that while we are talking about education for all, and we've committed to uh, global uh, global instruments like the SDGs, where we are saying education for all, that means that we'll have a proportion of young girls drop out of school because they got uh, they got pregnant. Okay. So yeah, it's a conversation of having are we get is these things happening? Because most of the times we think yeah. premarital sex is foreign. It's not. Uh, young people are sexually active. We're advocating for abstinence. Ab well, uh, it's a good conversation, but we still, I mean, as told ever since as a little girl, I am 26 years now, <laughs> that wow. I should abstain from sex, and uh, we still have our statis statistics reading 25% of girls dropping out of pregnant, uh, dropping cool. out of, uh, getting pregnant. So it's a whole conversation of the reality of that these issues are actually happening. Abstinence uh, is good, but it alone cannot eliminate the problem. It needs a supplementary method, and which I personally think contraceptives comes in as a remedy. Okay. Well, you spoke mm -hmm. about um, young girls dropping out of school because mm -hmm. of unwanted pregnancies, and which is really a consequence, right? Mm -hmm. What else is a consequence? Um, we have uh, our statistics again still show that uh, 3 million, 3,000 uh, girls and women die annually uh, due to childbirth and pregnancy related um, causes. And in Uganda, that translates about 21% women dying every day. That won't make news. You know, so you can imagine, we can put this perspective of a taxi, just one taxi moving, it has 14 people, and it gets an accident and that 14 crash. It will make mm -hmm. headlines everywhere. But the 21% of women that die every day because of that, it will not. So high mortal, um, maternal uh, death that come as a result of teenage pregnancy. And also, government spends a lot of money in trying to uh, treat and manage teenage uh, pregnancy-related cons uh, uh, consequences. So if you're talking about reaching a middle income status and then you're still spending sums of money in that, the, all these are deaths that can actually be avoided if we did the right thing. I think we need to sit and re-strategize. The right thing by you might be a right, a, you know, a <laughs> different story somewhere else. Nancy, you wanted to say something and I cut you short. Yeah, it was about the issue of information. There's mm. something that clicked my mind that it's very important to give young people the right information so that they don't mm. get it from the wrong sources. Sometimes peers give people the, the very wrong information. And I think, whereas we say that we shouldn't give information, I think as soon as a child, for example, a young girl is about to get menstruation, a girl at nine years sometimes is already having her menstruation. Mm -hmm. She should know mm -hmm. that pregnancy can occur because mm -hmm. of this and this. She should know that this is how I can manage menstrual hygiene. Mm -hmm. She should be given this information early enough by either the parent, the teacher, or any trusted source. So that whoever comes later, with information that is not right. Your child is already safeguarded with the right information from you and not from any other sources. When do you think is the right time to have this conversation? Not just with the girls, but mm -hmm. also with the boys. I notice we keep talking about, yeah. also I'll be blamed for having an all-female panel, so please let's balance <laughs> it out with the conversation. I, I, it's, it's not only about girls, and actually it's very important to give boys mm -hmm. even information on menstrual high menstruation, for example, to let mm -hmm. boys know, especially in primary school. There's this primary school has told about whereby the young boys in the school were laughing at the girls who had stained clothes. And then until the boys were taken to a conversation of what exactly menstruation is, and this is a mm -hmm. reproductive system, mm -hmm. this is how it happens, and they ended up supporting their, 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 their fellow colleagues, the girls, to stay in school and even help the, the fellow girls. And then there was now, you know, girls being kept in school because the boys were involved in that conversation. And okay. so it's important for boys and girls all to know all, you know, everything that happens to men, everything that happens to females, mm -hmm. so that to mm -hmm. balance the conversation. And the, the time frame, I think, depends from child to child. I think it's important for a parent or a guardian or a teacher to know I mean, this is the time for me to have this conversation with my child, but I think it should be early enough, not waiting until maybe someone is sexually active or is already 19, 20, 16, yeah. but as soon as the scientifically we say that even in eight years, somebody's already having their menstruation, yeah. nine, someone is, so the earlier to me, the better.
when did we have this conversation? When did you guys have these conversations? Maybe with your parents or, or your guardians? With my parents, the, the, the first time my mother, okay, my mother taught me the basics of uh, when I was about 15 on how to menstruate, but had already started menstruating, so she was not right in time. And the other conversation, the ever first time I talked, I had a candid conversation with my mother about contraceptive was when she was asking me if I was using it. Okay. Mercy? <laughs> Personally, <laughs> I never got any information from my mother or anyone at home, as in a boarding school, and I would get the information from peers or like fellow students, and the internet when I was old, and again when I went in the working environment, that's when I got the comprehensive information. Yeah. What were your friends <laughs> telling you in school? <laughs> Of course, most of them are myths and misconceptions. If you have sex when you're in your menstrual mystery, mystery periods, you won't get pregnant. If you have sex in water, you won't get pregnant. Those myths and misconceptions. What kind of yeah. friends did you have? <laughs> 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 when did you get these talks? My mom didn't tell me anything about it, no, any guardian. But that's something that I changed with my daughters. I have two daughters, and so I had this conversation with my nine-year-old and her nieces during the Christmas holidays. So. I'm like, I'm not going to wait until my girl is a teenager or what. She's nine, and we are going to, to have this conversation. So I'm glad we talked about it, and she yeah. asked questions. Some were like, so off. <laughs> Some were like, but I was, I was glad that I'm the one giving her yeah. this information, and we are having this conversation mother to, uh, to, to daughter, daughter at that age. I know her more than anybody else does yeah. anyway, more than her teachers or her friends or her cousins, mm -hmm. and so... It was a light talk, but it's the beginning of a conversation that I'll take further with her, of course. How did this conversation start? You said, come sit down. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, so like the way you talk to a nine-year-old is not the same way you're going to talk to a 20-year-old yeah. or someone at 16 or mm. a married colleague, right? Mm. And so it's also about, in a child, it was in a joking, child-friendly mm. manner. I want to know. After watching cartoons. <laughs> How, so I'm your nine-year-old. Yeah. What did you say? Uh, we, we're going to talk about menstruation. Mm -hmm. So this is how it, it is. I told her if it ever happens, it's not something she should be scared of, that it happens to every woman, mm -hmm. and it can happen to her too, mm -hmm. and it's very normal. And it it's can not or it will? It, it will, will. Mm -hmm. and it's something no, never to get scared of, because I just didn't want my child to go to school. She's having menstruation, and people are laughing at her. She's scared. She you hear of girls dropping out of school because of menstruation. That's the least thing I wanted her to do. But to know that this is a normal thing, not to freak out or feel yeah. she's scared or something. And so mm -hmm. what helped was she had her nieces, her cousins around her, and so it was all supportive. So we had a, it, it a brother. Like she was being embarrassed by yeah. her mother. <laughs> no, so we had a broader <laughs> conversation, all of us, with questions and answers and yeah. that kind of thing. But um, I was glad I did that. Yeah, Nancy talks about the, a very important aspect of uh, age appropriateness of information. Sexual reproductive health information is no, it's like how you start feeding a baby. You don't start them with cassava and then give them cellular later on. So you start with um, the age appropriateness of the information. For example, at eight year old, somebody, it's very important that somebody to know their body. They need to know that it's not actually not right for anybody to touch their private part, you mm -hmm. know, to touch their breast. So, um, so as they advance, then if, if they become uh, of a reproductive age, then you can start talking about issues of sex. It's, I mean, uh, consenting. You can talk about issues of contraceptives. And also sometimes um, why sexual productive health and information, they already think it's an NGO business. I mean, you guys are you're supposed to talk about this, mm -hmm. but I already think it's a, um, a role of everybody because we always think that um, young people are just in a home setting. You know, mm -hmm. Josephine knows I go back to my daughter, d daughter looks at me, you know, I go back to a home, there is mom and dad, but then the young people in this country that do not have that privilege, they are child-headed home states. They don't have the parent, they don't have. So if it's a religious leader that is talking about sexual productive health information, such a, a child will get the opportunity to get the information at church or at a mosque, you know? If it is the media reporting, talking, uh, talk, amplifying the voices of those young people, you know, a young person will just read or maybe watch a program and then they'll, be, they'll get the information. Yeah. 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 I guess that's why you're here. Yeah. But yeah. thank you for coming <laughs> to the show. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Yep.
salons. We offer professional barber, hairdressing at Lugogo Mall, Garden City, Forest Mall, Oasis Mall and Acacia Mall. Sparkle Salon. Professional, affordable and quality services. Welcome back. We're coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center Nile Room and we are talking about universal access to sexual reproductive health. Um, we'd like to take some questions from the studio audience. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Which advice would you give your nine year old if he they tells you that he has a boyfriend? Then would you allow your eighteen year old girl to have a boyfriend and next would you call them for an advice if they have? Usually you would First, you first give them counseling and tell them what is in for them. And that is what you tell them, the consequences of what that is. But then also, I'll put my perspective, not in the capacity of a mother, but also capacity of what is happening. We have nine-year-olds who are exploited into sex work. How many of you, young people who are here, how many of you up to now have told their parents they have boyfriends? Huh? A few. So by the time somebody comes and tells me they have a boyfriend, they are literally sexually active. I would give them advice depending on how to practice safe sex. I would give them, yes, I would give advice on how to protect themselves because I would never forgive myself if she tells me I have a boyfriend and the next thing we are treating a cause of unsafe abortion or we are treating ST, STIs, yet we could have prevented that from the very start. Okay, well, you asked them and no one bothered to answer. <laughs> how many of you have told your parents? They just find, find out. out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe from a mother's perspective, yeah. I think context is differ. Yeah. So the context of my nine-year-old and boyfriend issues could be a different context from another mother mm. who is in a different environment than mine. So it would be good to know what environment you're in with your child. But I think what's most important as parents or guardians is to always make sure that your children are able to approach you on any issues of life. Mm -hmm. If you ever have that relationship with your children, I think that's the best you can be in. Whether they are able to tell you about boyfriends, whether they're able to tell you about issues of school, anything, career, good or bad, mm -hmm. spiritual, social, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. If you ever break the, the walls, and this starts as soon as I think your baby is still in your arms, breastfeeding, and I think this is a relationship that we need to invest in as parents and guardians, that your child. And so I've also learned the context of a nine-year-old telling you about boyfriend <laughs> could also be different from your 18-year-old coming and telling you about boyfriend yeah. or your five-year-old coming and saying, I have a boyfriend. So it's all, it's all different. But I think what's important is give your child every information that they need and save them. Mm. Save them from a world where there is a lot of information going there that they, by the time they filter it, they're already in trouble. You're already treating AIDS, you're already treating STDs, you're already treating mm -hmm. unsafe abortions. And so you don't want to be in that position. And so it's important to have an open relationship with your children or with the children who are in your care. And I think maybe just to hint on something that in regard with what you're talking about uh, in regard to universal access is that it's important for us to, as a country, also to invest in, in a healthcare system whereby young people are able to go to health facilities and get all the information that they need mm. from the medical workers. Not everybody may have may have the chance to have a parent like me or a guardian like me. I think one of the reasons why I'm able to talk to my child is because of my career. Because I've got to see ch girls who have been abused. I've got to see children who have been f really you know, tortured sexually. I've seen sexual violence on children and on young girls. And with my career, I can't risk, I cannot <coughs> risk my child not having that information. But not every parent could have been exposed to all those other dangers. And so, and that is why we need to invest in a healthcare system whereby young people go to the health facility and get services and also have universal access to these services. Because first of all, young people are not able to afford how many of us here are able to afford maybe there are places you have to go and you have to pay for the HIV test, no? You have to pay for STD tests and treatment. I mean, as a young 18-year-old, 19-year-old, where do you get this money? And so that's why we are saying our state should prioritize universal access to sexual and reproductive health services for young people who do not have cash to, to make that payment. There are people who are not able to pay for these services. And so as we have UPE, we should also have UHC, <laughs> whereby there is a comprehensive health coverage for everybody, women right. who have been raped, 
uh, survivors of sexual violence in conflict, I mean, you should not feel the burden, you know, of uh, the violation of experience or the, your health needs should not be your burden because there are people who cannot afford these services and All so right. it should be accessible to everybody. All right, thank you, Nancy. Next question. Uh, my name is Hope. I wanted to ask, do these contraceptives have side effects? Okay, we've, we've tackled that quite a number of times, but just briefly, if any of you could, could answer her. Uh, do contraceptives have side effects? Yes, they do. Um, and uh, these side effects vary from one individual to mm -hmm. another. Uh, our bodies are quite different, it's like the same way you see I'm dark skinned and Josephine is light skinned. So that's how our bodies are different and they react differently. But most of these side effects are actually not permanent, you know. Um, they are, so to some people they start at a time and they stop um, after a certain period of time, or sometimes you actually need to shift from one method to another. Okay. Yeah. I also Perfect. have uh, an answer to our question. At times these contraceptives are misused. Young people take a lot of contraceptives, yet they should be at times limited. So due to lack of information, whenever they go to pharmacies, they just buy without getting information from the pharmacist or any other medical person. Yet initially they should get information about the whole contraceptive and how it works and the side effects. Mm. So in the meantime or in the long run, at times they get uh, different complications and they attribute it to the contraceptive, just yeah. yet it was a misuse. Yeah. So you mean yeah. you just go to the pharmacist and say, I want this, and they Some hand it to you, they don't, they don't yeah. talk to you? That's, I think that's because of fear. Yeah. Yeah. Young people, because of a stigma, you're already sexually active, but you know <laughs> if I go to the health facility to ask for a condom or to go and ask for pills, people are going to say, oh, you young girl, what do you Sweet. want here? Mm. Leave those things for old yeah. people, right? And so they sneak in to buy these things from, you know, places which are risky and dangerous. But if we had youth-friendly services whereby mm. youth are talked to in a friendly manner, in a healthy manner, and that is what we are advocating for, that we have youth-friendly services mm -hmm. in our health facilities so that yeah. we don't have youth sneaking in back door to get very dangerous you know, s services they don't even know how to use. Or, yeah. But if they have this nurse or this medical worker who is going to give them all the information in a very healthy manner. But I like to say it's true that some family planning uh, uh, methods, methods have, uh, side uh, have side effects, which are scientifically proven. But I think mm -hmm. one of the things is they are also miss on some of these methods. Someone will tell you, oh, if you take family planning, you'll die, you'll get yeah. blind. I mean oh, this is going and to happen, true. and it's really not true. true. But okay. some have been scientifically proven that it is true. And so mm -hmm. this is information that you get from the health facility so that you make an informed decision. decision. All right. Yes, very quickly. Yeah, thank you. I'm Nando Duclair from Macquarie University. I have two questions. Like, if, I, if someone continuously uses those contraceptives, can they become less effective since the body has become maybe used? to the contraceptives and another question is can someone get pregnant in water <laughs> 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 Mercy why don't you start us with that one <laughs> as, as long as the, the sex is penetrative one can get pregnant in water and then protective <laughs> yeah you, you, if it's not protected and it's penetrative you you'll get pregnant I yeah. like her question because it's, it's evidence that they are myths, no? Yeah. Like, people, we, we don't have all the information. Yeah, like you may think it's a joke, but people make decisions over these so-called inf wrong information given by, by peers. And so you'll have a young person going to have sex in the swimming pool, yeah. thinking that if we do it there, we are not going to get pregnant. Why? Yeah. Because they don't have the right information. information. Yeah. Right. Do you want to also yeah. then answer the next question, the first yeah. question she asked? Yeah. Well, the, do contraceptives become less effective if they overstay in our bodies? If you, if you if you overuse continuously use. overuse them, uh, the, the answer is no. Um, and that's why we always insist on you having accessing contraceptives from a trained or a skilled health provider. Because then you're going to be taken through the, avail the available options and you make a decision. But uh, just because I've used an implant for 10 years or, years. or for 5 years, it does not mean that uh, eh, during this towards the fourth year may get pregnant because it has become it has been long in my yeah, body. it has been long in my body mm -hmm. so as long as you you know when uh, you're supposed to go for renew of that co contraceptive or that family planning method then it is still as effective 
as when you put it yesterday. Okay. Uh, one more question. Okay, thank you so much. I'm Carol. Is there a specific age for when someone should start contraceptives? Okay. <laughs> the constitution, our constitution, uh, anybody below the age of 18 years is a child and they don't expect them to be sexually active. So considering our police environment, they would arrest you if they found, found me providing a contraceptive to a 15 year old. But scientifically, anybody in sexual reproduct who is sexually active or in the reproductive age can start using the contraceptive. So that's why we've been making a lot of noise because we want the policy environment to be as friendly as the science that we have. Our constitution defines anybody below the age of 18 years as a child. So, and their, their reasoning or their explanation is that they don't expect you to be um, sexually active. That's why we had issues with our s sexual reproductive health s guidelines and service standards, because in, the pol in that policy, we, uh, there were speculations that people, who are young people who are 14 years a below, um, 40, yeah, from 14 years, can have access to SRHR information. And the minister said, no, I cannot launch those guidelines. Our laws are clear you know that anybody below the age of 18 years is not supposed to expect is a child cannot decide to when to have sex and for that reason they cannot have um, a contraceptive or have access to SRHR information. So what, what, what's really now coming out is that if, if a 17 year old went to a pharmacy or even came to a, a, a known reproductive health center mm. to get this kind of, of uh, this access to reproductive health services, they mm. could get arrested um, or the provider could get arrested. In, p in our policy documents, that is anybody, that is what it is. But uh, professionally, the health workers are actually trained that if they are convinced from the best of their knowledge that actually this young person is sexually active, then they should give them the service because we have 17-year-olds uh, who are doing sex work. But isn't that still breaking the law? It's still breaking the law bar. What can we do? That's why we keep uh, advocating for uh, a conducive or a supportive policy environment when it comes to sexual reproductive health. Because we have cases where actually young people are bounced at the health centers and they don't want to provide them with, servi with services. Or I, a young person comes in, they have terminated pregnancy and they literally need post-abortion care. And the health worker says, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to have my certificate revoked. I am unable to provide you the service. Yet even when, of, of course, there's also the issue of the ignorance of the law. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take another short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. We are coming to you from the Kampala Serena Conference Center Nile Room and we're talking about universal access to sexual reproductive health. We're taking some questions from the audience. Yes. Thanks. Um my suggest us from KIU. My question is what is the position and the role of the VHT in reproductive health? Okay. Well you could first of all before you answer that tell us what VHT is mm -hmm. okay. for those of, of us who don't know and then mm -hmm. you could go ahead with that. Okay. VHT means uh, village health team, and they're usually used by many health uh, service providers, NGOs, and also the government hospitals. They use VHTs to disseminate information in the communities, to give information to young people, even to the adults, to women who have uh, maternal issues, to refer, and also to give feedback to these uh, NGOs, to these uh, hospitals or clinics and uh, health centers. So they're actually, they're pre-qualified uh, medical people. They actually know a lot of information about uh, medical things and, and diseases. They can actually, some of them are used to give the service, the administration of the service. Like, for example, in family planning, there are some services they can give. Like, we have a three-month injection which they can actually administer, but of okay. course they have to go through a training. All right. Yeah. Okay, the next <coughs> question, I'll just take two more. Thank you so much. I'm anxious from Macquarie University. Personally, it hurts me, the government spending billions of money, because somebody had sex at the wrong time, perhaps with the wrong person. Mm. So, do you think sex education is so imperative in our levels, primary and secondary, so that it can fill that gap of information? Thank you. 
Okay. Then secondly, we spoke about this at the beginning. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then secondly, uh, our parents they shy away from telling us such important information about sex. Mm. Do you have any initiative that can help? Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with um, your last question. Just answer the last one because the first <laughs> one was the big entry point into our conversation. Okay, yeah. so um, can, that is the whole reason why we are having the conversation of whether sexuality education is actually important or not important. But then uh, we have the national education framework that the government recently launched that guides the, prov uh, the provision of sexuality education in primary, secondary, and up to all education levels. So it is an initiative that we are doing, and also it's the role that civil society is doing to make sure that um, young people in those classes or in at that age group have access to information so they can make health choices and informed choices as well. Okay. All right. The final question. There's a lady at the back there. I just want to take hers, and we can. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Um, what are the like three basic things a girl should first do if she's raped? Uh, my second question is, what are the best contraceptives you recommend for the youth and for the married? Thank you. Okay. I think uh, maybe to just ask, also ask a bit on this question about parents. I think one of the things we have done as uh, Reproductive Health Uganda is to have conversations with parents also, religious leaders, cultural leaders, uh, all district leaders, parents and all that kind of thing. Sometimes even through trainings or capacity buildings or to have yeah. these conversations to like really as people see the need, but also one of the reasons I shared my own personal experience, even as part of this show, is to let parents know that this is an important conversation to have with your young people. And okay. also maybe to I'll answer the last question about you, my colleagues will answer the other one mm -hmm. about what to do when you're raped as a girl. It's important when you, you experience rape, within 72 hours, please go and seek medical intervention. Why? Because Within 72 hours, it's still, it's still possible for the HIV virus to be uh, stopped from growing in your body. And so if you go to the medical facility after 72 hours, then it, may, it is, becomes very difficult for you to be given uh, treatment. Uh, so you'll be given PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, mm -hmm. from the medical facilities, and this will help to, so that you don't get HIV. And you can be tested for pregnancy. If, you're not pr if you are not pregnant before the rape, you'll be given uh, an emergency contraceptive that you you will help you. You'll be given wound care if there are any injuries that happen. But also what's important is you can, you'll get counseling and psychosocial support because of what? That experience. And it's also important to let the police know th what happened so that you can also help to get justice because justice will help to stop the perpetrators from doing it in the community, sends a message out there for the perpetrators not to not to to continue. And so, those are some of the important steps to take immediately, as soon as. And it's also been advised that it's important that as soon as the rape occurs, please just don't bathe or clean yourself because whatever fluids left in your body can help to be used as evidence against the perpetrator. So any blood, spermatozoa, or any fluids that or hair whatever can be used as evidence and so don't bathe just go to the medical facility <laughs> and <laughs> to, to the police and then they help you and it's very very important to do all this within 72 hours and then to quickly go to uh, what family planning methods are good for young people and those that are good for the marriage i started with um, an analogy of i am dark skinned and uh, josephine is light skinned so are our bodies our bodies are different, and that's why we always advise that you get the family planning method, so contraceptive, from a qualified or skilled health provider. So it, it is when, the, when they will probably do the necessary tests, or they give you the different methods, they tell you the side effects, and then you select which one you think is suitable for you. If you choose a method and for some reason does not work appropriately to expectations, you can always switch. Maybe also right, just so to tip a bit. We, we just have very, uh, um, our time is very, very quickly spent, yeah. but I think she's adequately answered it in saying that you need to actually go to yeah. a qualified person to talk yeah. to you about that. Yeah. We were speaking earlier about the consequences and yeah. we, we didn't really exhaust it. Yeah. So I think it was you, Anna, that was speaking about them. Mm, yeah. Yes. So uh, what are the consequences of um, unintended pregnancies? You know, some people call them unwanted, but we all believe that all children are wanted, so we prefer to use the uh, unintended, is the issue of unsafe abortions. I'm sure 
um, or most, of, most of you have either read an article, you've watched news of somebody who has tried to terminate pregnancy using crude ways. We have girls dying because they've used hangers. They've taken tons of detergents in order to terminate pregnancy. And all these contribute to maternal death. As a country, unsafe abortions contribute to up to 26% to maternal death. You know, and when we talk about 26%, we are talking about lives. These are human beings. So it's not 26% over 10,000 shillings, which is money, which you can only spend. So it's always very important that also we look at that as a consequence. We have girls that actually lose uteruses. We have girls who will, who will even die back in their communities, and the media will never get to know about it. And us people here, maybe in Kampala, will not know about it as well. So unsafe abortion is un one of the consequences. And then we have school dropouts. You know? Yeah, you mentioned the school drop-ups earlier. Yeah. What policies and regulations have been put in place in oh. regards to unsafe abortions and also um, and and what okay. do you call it? Uh, and unintended. Unintended, unintended pregnancy. pregnancy. Yeah. Okay, I will start with uh, intended pregnancy. The Ministry of Gender, I think, at about two years ago, launched um, uh, the national strategy to end child marriages and teenage pregnancy, and uh, it's uh, it's been rolled out in different districts and it's being implemented. And also, um, our constitution still we talk about we have the talks about abortion provision of abortions in different. Um, but our uh, abortion in this country is restricted, not really like prohibited or unacceptable. It is restricted. They give instances under which it's supposed to be performed. So it is also uh, one other policy engage uh, uh, one other law that we can dwell on because we have to take in cognizance of the fact that actually most people, the pregnancies either they've been raped and they have nothing to do with choice. So still we have our laws, we have the adolescent health policy which is still being under review, but at least we have an older version that still talks about the issue. What's and the adolescent health policy? Yeah, so the adolescent health policy is a, a, a policy or a do policy document by the Ministry of Education that pro, uh, guides the provision, the provision and access of adolescent health services to all young people in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's is um we still under review and we haven't had the last draft but at least we still have the other draft and as young people we call upon you this policy affects your lives you know <laughs> we we call upon you to i mean demand f that this policy is actually finalized and passed yeah all right okay um and as we close i'm sure our time is just about uh, yeah. past spent how far has reproductive health uganda gone in sensitizing informing and educating people mm -hmm. about all of this information that you've just shared. Thanks. Uh, most will add on, but I think one thing to let the young people know that we have youth friendly services at Reproductive Health Uganda. And in Kampala, we are at Kamo Chakatego Road, but we also have branches across the country. Please go and we have medical personnel who are trained to address issues of young people specifically. And so, without any stigma or discrimination, equal treatment with all the care that you need. And so, Please feel free to visit uh, for any information or any service that you need. But also just use this chance and say that as a country, we also need to invest in universal health coverage for all our citizens. Not everybody is able to pay for these services. Young people, survivor, survivors of sexual violence do not need to get the burden of paying for the medical costs of the violation they've gone through. We have young women in northern Uganda who are been affected by conflict. Honestly, they do not need to feel to pay the medical costs of the sexual reproductive health conditions that they have, the gynecology, uh, the gyne complications that have arisen out of violence. They do not have to pay for that money. Women are not able to pay for those costs. And so that's why we're saying, let's reduce as much as possible for out of pocket cash payments for sexual and reproductive health service because that's an inherent right for all Ugandans. All right, uh, Arish is a youth led organization and she talked about youth friendly services. We believe that uh, there is nothing without us. So if at work for the youth, they have to be engaged. And that's why they've been engaged in different uh, services, in different uh, programs. So if you come at RHU and uh, you are youth, it's a, it's a fellow youth who will talk to you, not the older person. Because young people always have that fear and, and they feel embarrassed talking to an older person, like someone talking to a 60 year old person and you're telling them that, uh, I had sex and I need an, an emergency contraceptive. It really embarrasses. So, and we've built capacity of service providers, different service providers, health workers, the police, and everyone who is engaged in these uh, in health services to avoid discriminating young people. So we're not discriminative. 
no matter the age, no matter the employment, no matter uh, the way you come is how you're treated. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to give us in just two lines your closing remarks? I'll take home from this conversation. Okay. I want to tell young people that whatever decision they make now, whatever bad decision they make now, will catch up with them. So if, for example, if you're to have sex, make sure it's protected. Because whatever decision you do now, regarding sexual and reproductive health is going to affect you. It's going to even affect your children. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Masi. Uh, thank you. I think my closing remarks really lines um, to the government and to the young people. One, uh, to the government, sexual reproductive health and rights is as important as issues uh, of national security, as as important as issues of developing uh, infrastructure. So it's very important that we actually prioritize and invest in money so that we don't always do post-mortem and we are treating complications. Okay. To the young people, you need to get interested in, the, in these conversations. You know, we are talking about meaningful youth engagement, but young people, have you taken the initiative to be knowledgeable, to read about these things, to look out for the policies, have information about these policies? I understand as a young people get always get swept, uh, issues will go in the streets, uh, this, but if you call a young person to come and say there is no, uh, we need access to contraceptives, they can tell me if I'm lying. You need to buy them a bottle of soda or buy them a t-shirt as motivation. So mm -hmm. these issues for affect our lives. We need to like get on board, get into policy b boardrooms, see what the policies are saying, demand for these services. All right. Yeah. And finally, uh, Nancy, in two lines, two sentences. Uh, I think just to say that sexual reproductive health is a right for everybody. Yeah. Everybody needs to have a safe uh, reproductive life. And it's, uh, a good one and so this is something that our state needs to invest in it like my colleague has said it's it's an important issue to prioritize in and have you know to invest in universal health coverage that caters for all sexual and reproductive health needs of our people in the country okay well thank you all so much for taking the time to come and speak with us about mm -hmm. universal access to sexual reproductive health um, well that brings us to the end of our show for tonight coming up is NTV weekend edition <music>